Today I'm reacting to Henry Golding's watch collection. Do you know him? Henry Golding's. I know his face. I don't really know him. He's an actor. In Spider-Man or something. He was in The Gentleman. In The Gentleman. That's some f***ing movie. F***ing boxing and s***. What was he again? He was like the bad guy trying to kill Matthew McConaughey from memory. This is a big f***ing number. Oh, this is a big f***ing gun. Hurts, does it? He does look like a bad guy to be fair like. Before we get into the video, please make sure you subscribe to the channel now. And if you want to buy or sell your watch, of course, go to prideandpinion.com. I'm going to get destroyed by all these, <laughs> all these watch geeks. <laughs> Why? Are you wearing Hublot or what's the crack? Hey guys, it's Henry Golding here and I'm going to be going through my personal watch collection. Another GQ video. GQ gives us content, mate. Unbelievable. I actually think that we made GQ big. GQ, like, come on, mate. Let me present a video. Like, come on. I'll do it for free. Because if you have been able to make a f ton of content, brilliant. Thank you for that. But let's talk. Let's talk! And make some more watch videos so we can react to them. Yeah, make more watch videos because we need more content, please. GQ. I've chosen a lot of my pieces because of the love of the design and the love of, in some cases, how rare they are or how difficult they can be to get. Interesting, interesting. But at the same time, like I said, like I love wearing them. The designers impetus for creating such uh, something so beautiful is to be seen on a wrist. He's British, is he? He's Malaysian British. So he was born in Malaysia. Mm. I've been in Malaysia. Kuching, Cat City. Pussy City. <laughs> Pussy City. Pussy City. My first watch was when I could afford one. This Cartier Pasha, which I just fell completely in love with from the blue Robuchon to the carved out details on the face. I was sort of drawn to it. It was when I finished this big travel show, pretty much my entire wage for three months of working. And I, <laughs> I, was, I was kind of just like, it felt so right at the time. But thinking back, I was just like, wow, you're an idiot. He spent all his money, everything he earned in three months on a Cartier Porsche. I'm very fortunate that I don't have to call you an idiot because luckily you call yourself an idiot. I wouldn't say that I'm a, I'm a huge, huge collector, but I know what I love and I'm passionate about the ones that I pick because they mean so much to me. It was one of those ones that looked elegant, but also had this sort of sportiness to it. Would you say this is your favorite watch? You're gonna hurt its feelings, but no. But I love it dearly, I love it dearly. This watch actually has a really, really cool story, you know. The story that dates back out of the early 1930s, where a really good customer of Cartier, the Pasha of my cash, asked Louis Cartier for a watch to be made specifically for him. You know what a Pasha is? Nope. If you Google it, by the way, which I had to because I needed to figure out the exact translation of the word Pasha, it means a man in power, the highest officer in power. The Pasha of Marrakesh was the highest person in power in Marrakesh, probably. So basically the watch was a one-off watch that was made for the Pasha of Marrakesh, but Cartier made it a proper line of watches in 1985. Funny thing is about the Pasha as well, Gerald Genta, the most famous watch designer in the world, the guy that designed the Royal Oak and the Nautilus, also designed the Pasha. He reimagined the Pasha. He didn't design the original one in 1930s. He helped with the design of the Pasha that was introduced in 1985. You could pick up a Pasha, which uh, it's not my personal favorite Cartier, may I add, from about $1,500 upwards, depending what metal, material, size, etc. I do think it really, really suits Henry, to be fair. So this is the watch that I wear the most. Pretty much never comes off my wrist. To Whole Foods, or <laughs> going to like anywhere, usually I'm wearing this. This is the Patek 5711. Steel case, discontinued as of this year. And even if you could find them, the waiting list is five to 10 years, which is kind of crazy. You have to have Patek Philippe actually accept you as a buyer, and especially now that they don't sell them anymore. The steel bracelets are worth more than say like the rose gold or the precious metals. It's something that I would never sell just because I love it so much. 
But yeah, they, they, they go for a pretty penny now. You're nearly right. The rose gold 5711 is still worth more than a steel 5711 today. Not in comparison to the retail price, by the way, because you can't compare that. But the market value of a rose gold 5711 is higher than the market value of a steel 5711. Gerald Genta, the designer. He knows Gerald Genta. Two watches, both designed by the same dude. He did the Royal Oak as well as the Nautilus. Royal Oak, also designed by Gerald Genta. This is why it was so important. He designed everything that's good. It's weird. If you're a watch guy and you see the Nautilus on somebody's wrist, you're just like, holy crap, that guy's either got taste or he's an extremely lucky man and have spent a ridiculous amount of money. I'm not sure which category I fall into. So. <laughs> the Omega Seamaster DeVille. Class. F***ing class. Class. This is the watch that I wore on my first movie. So this was something that Nick Young's father gave to him, and we don't see sort of in, in the movie. So it almost represents his presence for him, an heirloom that's been passed down to him. So it means a, a tremendous amount. Something like that really grounds your character and, and, and gives you a time and a place. I absolutely love his passion. He attaches stories to watches. That's what I love. That's what I do with every single of my watches. The value of a watch is never important. The story that a watch carries is. It's a, a manual wind instead of automatic where it has sort of a pendulum creating sort of energy for the watch to consume it through the day. This has a spring, a coil spring. So you wind it to wind the spring and then slowly through the day it releases, giving you the, the, the movement. It's sort of breathing air and oxygen into this inanimate object and bringing it alive. I'm probably totally wrong, but, but that's what I believe is true. <laughs> I love this Omega. I love vintage Omegas in general. I love the Omega Seamaster DeVille's. They're incredible watches, which you can pick up really, really cheap. You can pick up a watch like that from about $600 upwards. There's a really cool history with the Omega Seamaster. The Omega Seamaster is actually older than the Rolex Submariner. The Seamaster was first introduced in 1948. The Omega Seamaster DeVille was introduced in 1960. But in 1967, Omega brought out the DeVille as a separate line. I absolutely love that watch. The fact that he attaches a story to that watch makes that watch unbelievable. This is a Tudor Black Bay. This is one of the first Tudor Black Bays. This watch means a tremendous amount to me. This was when I was still doing sort of travel shows and running through the jungles and, and going into sort of devastation in around Southeast Asia. And this was the replacement to the, to the Seiko that I mentioned earlier. So this was the upgrade that my wife bought me for my wedding day. She wanted to get me a watch that I could wear throughout that, that entire period. The backstory with Tudor is that they used to make the cases for Rolex. They have that build quality at a definitely much more of a affordable sort of price range. Uh, it's a little bit different. They didn't make the cases for Rolex. Rolex made the cases for Tudor because the Tudor brand and Rolex brand are the same. It's the same watch brand, basically. But for this, on a NATO strap is unbeatable. I literally trek through jungles, up mountains, go diving and it stays with me pretty much all the time. If you're looking for a watch that's gonna last a tremendously long time, this is definitely one of the best. The Tudor Black Bay is a dive or a sports lineup within the Tudor brand. The Tudor Black Bay was first introduced in 2012, a 41 millimeter all steel dive watch with a red slash burgundy bezel. An incredible home run because the watch became massively popular from about 2014, 2015, where they introduced the watch as well with the blue bezel and with the black bezel and I actually think that his watch dates back out of 2015. The reason for this is between 2012 and 2016 Tudor made the writing on the dial look like a smiley. <laughs> From 2015 2016 they made the writing straight. You can pick up a Tudor Black Bay from about $1,600, $1,700. So again a really cool watch and a watch that carries a lot of sentimental value. So this is your classic, classic Cartier tank. Design's been around for, for so, so long. One of the most timeless, timeless pieces I think I have in my collection. A leather band with a small, dainty gold watch is, is one of my favorite things. And Cartier especially have just the intricacies of detail with the blue Robuchon and the sort of faintly blue dials. Very small details you can pick up on in the light. 
Um, and I like that about watches. The Cartier Tank for me is one of the most versatile watches ever created. However, I am never able to wear it because it looks stupid on me. The Tank is an absolute classic and I think deserves to be in every man's um, collection because they're not ridiculously expensive again, um, but you get so much wear out of them. This goes with what I'm wearing today. It's one of those like really classic things or you could put it on with a beautiful Tom Ford suit with a tuxedo and it wouldn't go amiss. It's like a superpower with some of these watches. It's like it will mold in with anything you throw it out. I love the Cartier tank and I love how it looks on other people's wrists. But when I put it on, it looks dog shit. The Cartier Tank and I don't have a great relationship, let's put it that way. But yes, it belongs in everyone's collection. And you can buy them really cheap, again, from about $1,500 upwards. Unbelievable. This is just cool. He has a really cool watch collection. I don't even know what this is called, but I'm reading it right now. Casio F84W. One of the cheapest watches in my collection. God tier. God tier. God tier. But one of the watches I actually wear a tremendous amount. I bought it in Tokyo when I was filming um, Snake Eyes for 800 yen, which is about $8. The drawer really was the seamlessness between the body and the strap and how kind of elegant, weirdly elegant it looks. The F84W. It's actually a really rare watch, funny enough. It's a near exact copy of the predecessor of the F91W, which is the F87W. The only difference is the F87W has a red line, a red border, and the F84W has a blue line a blue border. This is a watch dating back into the early 80s and the watch today still carries the exact same functionality. It's called tear. The Rolex GMT Master 2, the 2019 version, so it has a Jubilee band, which I thoroughly love. And that was one of the main reasons why I got it, because just because of the band is so beautiful. The fact that they sort of switched over to the ceramic sort of bezels. I think all steel bracelets and, and steel sports versions of any luxury watch that are extremely hard to get. Usually there's like either a waiting list or you have to pay a little bit extra. That's absolutely correct. And what a cool watch it is. Again, I love the Pepsi. I love the functionality of a GMT. As I travel all around the world, same as him, it's really handy to have a GMT function. And the GMT function is a function on a watch where you can read multiple time zones in one go. But I got this for the sheer reason of I've always loved loved this type of sports bracelet and it's hardy. I beat my watches. I don't like wearing them and being prissy about them. If they get scratched, they get scratched. That's, that just adds to their patina. You can see how scratched that bracelet is and I'm really bad with this, but uh, I love wearing it. Um, and it's probably the, the heaviest that I own. Every scratch in a watch tells a story and that is so important for me. Scratch this at the bollocks, but that's because I do a lot of porn stuff, as you know. <laughs> Don't ever be scared to wear a watch because you scratch it. Doesn't matter. It just adds more story to your watch. Final watch I'm going to talk about is the IWC Portuguesa. This is the watch that I wore to my first Oscars with a beautiful Ralph Lauren custom tuxedo. Felt a million bucks and this watch was uh, my companion for that night. It's one of the larger watches that I have actually, it's probably the largest. It's beautiful, classic design. IWC do great watches and, and, and not crazy, crazily sort of out of reach. It's one of the brands that have, have been around for the longest time. 154 or 155 years today. Started in America, moved to Switzerland. That's why it's called International Watch Company, IWC, or as I adapt it as the Irish watch company, IWC. F love it. So you know you're getting the value and the historic value, I suppose, in watches. And it's all about pomp and, and history uh, when it comes to luxury brands and how long they've been around, how long they've been innovating. Uh, but IWC is, is definitely one of the, uh, the brands that uh, are consistent. I absolutely agree. <laughs> IWC indeed is consistent. Let's put it this way. If I open an IWC catalog from 2007 and I compare that with their new watch catalog of 2022, uh, the watches are near identical. Consistent IWC is for sure. And I feel that the popularity today of IWC is growing massively. And I really like that. IWC always has my props. I love it. And uh, I think we're going to see way more of IWC in the near, near future.
Watches are an absolute luxury. You do not need them. If you're in a, in a sensible place to be able to afford them, why not luxuriate in them? All right, guys, that's it for talking through all of my watch collection. Amazing spending time with you all, and hopefully it inspires you to create, collect, and garner more special pieces in your own collection. I love this guy. This guy has a pure passion for watches. If you take out the 5711, his watch collection would probably be worth $25,000, but it's not about the value. That's what he shows. Every single watch has a story, and that's what I love. What a guy, what a watch collector. Unbelievable, Henry. You're a god there. You're some man. And it's really hard for me to say that about anyone. I'm not, I'm a I'm not a nice guy, right? I'm a dick. But for this, unbelievable. You're some man.